from the Misconceptions, a program that is dedicated to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Ramu Gassain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International. Welcome to the show, Doctor. It's a real pleasure to have you come and share some of your insights with us. Thank you very much, Ramu. It's a great privilege to be here. Now, we've been working on these shows together and we've been able to ask some really important questions and we've been able to see that there are real solid answers in the Bible. Now, today I would like to look at specifically, uh, do we really see evidence of creation and design in the stars themselves? Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. In fact, um, we do, um, without a shadow of a doubt. Last episode, we talked about how the galaxies appear to be arranged in concentric spherical shells with our Milky Way galaxy near the centre. But when we look at our own Milky Way galaxy, it's fascinating to see where our sun is positioned within it. You know, if we were too close to the central bulge of the galaxy, it would be a very hostile environment with very intense radiation, such that no life could exist on planet Earth. If we were too far out on the outer edges of the universe, it would also be very difficult for life to be sustained on our planet. But our sun is in fact at just the right distance away from the center of the universe. We're about um, 28,000 light years away from the center of, uh, sorry, of our galaxy. And uh, not only that, but we are uh, in between two of the spiral arms of our galaxy. Now, if we were placed right in one of the spiral arms and we looked up at the night sky, all we would see would be a mass of stars in all directions. Mm. And it would be very hard for us to understand what our galaxy was like and what the rest of the universe was like. But being situated where we are, we get an excellent view. It's just like we have been invited to investigate and to discover what uh, our universe is like. So it's really important to be in a particular position so that there can be a life on Earth. Is that what you're... That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. If the sun was in the wrong place, then um, we would not be able to live um, in, uh, on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. But not only that, the sun itself is uh, not really just a boring old ordinary star. It's actually a very special star. It, um, it gives just the right amount of heat um, for life to be sustainable on the Earth. If the sun was, for instance, a lot cooler, then our Earth would have to be much, much closer to it, which mm. means that we would rotate around the orbit around the, the sun much more rapidly. We'd have a very short year. We could even become tidally locked so that one face of the Earth only faced the sun and the other face was always in darkness. And so we're at a, a special place in terms of just our own solar system. Sounds like we're finely tuned. We are finely tuned yeah. indeed. And then if you take a look at just planet Earth itself, it's amazing that the axis on which our planet spins is tilted at 23 and a half degrees to the plane in which the Earth orbits around the Sun. Wow. And it's that tilt which gives us our annual cycle of seasons. So we have from summer to winter and, and the in-between spring and autumn seasons. And that, of course, means that the whole cycle of life in vegetation and so on is able to operate effectively on our planet. Mm. It seems like it was set in order. It's impossible for these things to be a fluke or coincidental. I absolutely agree. In fact, one of the evidences for something having been designed is um, the fact that it is extremely improbable. That's not the only evidence, but it's one of the key things. And when we look at all the combinations of things which have to be just right for, for life to be able to exist on planet Earth, we see it pointing towards these things having been designed. Mm. Another example that uh, we all would know about is our moon. Mm. You know, the moon is essential for life on the Earth. It's about one quarter the size of the Earth, but its orbit is such that it causes the tides to operate so that the ocean, uh, the coastal oceans are constantly recycled and cleansed so there are no stagnant waters formed by just stationary waters, um, but in such a way that the tides do not then flood the continents. It's a beautifully balanced system. Mm. We also find that our moon is exactly the same size from our perspective as the sun, which means that eclipses are possible. 
the moon is actually 400 times smaller than the sun, mm. but it's 400 times closer. So it appears to be the same size. You know, nowhere else in our solar system are total solar eclipses possible from wow. the surface of any of the other planets. Mm -hmm. So we have this amazing combination of, uh, of our position in the galaxy, the nature of our sun, the nature of our planet Earth, uh, the nature of the moon, all of which is just this amazing, uh, highly improbable set of circumstances, all of which point very clearly to there being a design. I mean, were there any, surely, if it's that intricate or uh, that uh, specific or tuned, some of the words that I used, surely there would have been famous scientists in history which would have come to this same result. Absolutely. And in fact, um, Sir Isaac Newton is a very good case in point. He was uh, nominated as the greatest scientist in the world, looking at all of the amazing um, discoveries and, uh, and principles that he laid down and his contributions to mathematics and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you know Sir Isaac Newton was uh, a Bible-believing Christian? He actually really? wrote more about theology than he wrote about science in his life. You would never gather that, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I've heard his name so many times, I never knew that. Well, of course, Newton's law of gravity is perhaps the most famous. Uh, That's right. That de you know, determined the nature of the, of the uh, law of gravitation. Uh -huh. But Newton had a very interesting thing to say, and uh, let me read you a quotation from one of his works. He says this, Atheism is senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. This most beautiful system of sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as the Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God or universal ruler. Mm. The supreme God is a being eternal, infinite, absolutely perfect. Wow. He was a smart man. He was indeed. He was what someone would probably call an intellectual, an academic, and he believed in God. He did indeed. And many, many leading scientists today unswervingly hold to the truth of this book, God's Word, and what it tells us, particularly in the opening chapters of Genesis, about the creation of the universe. Some of the things that I struggle with personally, I mean, this whole idea of distant starlight, I mean, if the Earth is truly, it's a young Earth or a young universe, then how is it possible that we're able to see you know, distant stars which are supposedly um, you know, thousands, perhaps millions of you know, light years away? How, what sort of answer can you provide for a question like that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, Rommel. It's one that people have struggled with uh, for many years. In fact, some people have actually used this, uh, this question or their inability to find an answer to that question as um, a, an excuse, I guess, or perhaps a reason for rejecting God's Word, the Bible. Mm. They say that because the universe is of such staggering and vast extent that these millions of light years of distance are so, um, you know, have been measured and are true, then the Bible's history of just 6,000 years can't possibly be true. And because of that, they've walked away from believing that the Bible is indeed God's word. Very, very sad, particularly as there are very, very sound answers to that, that particular question. Mm. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that this whole idea of a light year, no, a light year is actually a measure of distance. Mm. It's not a measure of time. Okay. Now, you might think I'm sort of spitting hairs here, <laughs> <laughs> but there is a very good basis for why I make that observation. You see, the distances that we observe in the universe are very likely real. They are vast, absolutely immense. But you know, the psalmist said in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Mm. So the fact that the universe is so huge is actually not surprising, is it? Mm. Because God is revealing to us the enormity and the greatness of his power. Is that what you mean by the glory of God? Uh, that's God's one aspect of yeah, it, okay. yes, yes, particularly uh -huh. God's greatness as revealed in the astonishing dimensions of the universe. Mm. So the distances are probably real and Einstein's general relativity equations and so on have established that 
from an observer's perspective, the speed of light is a constant. From an observer's perspective? From an observer's perspective. Okay. Now, that would say that as we observe the light coming to us from distant galaxies, then it would appear that it must have been travelling for thousands of millions of years. But that's why I made the distinction before about a light year as a measure of distance, not time. Because the third part of the equation, if you like, is time itself. And it turns out, fascinatingly, that time is not a constant throughout the universe. Now, this kind of plays with your mind a bit. Yes. <laughs> um, but there's good experimental verification of it. Einstein's equations, in fact, predicted that this would be the case. Okay. You know, if you had a, a very accurate atomic clock and you took it to the top of a high mountain, uh, let's say it was about uh, 1,600 metres high, that clock would run faster than an identical atomic clock at sea level. And the reason it runs faster is because time itself actually runs faster the further away we move uh, from altitudes. the centre of the Earth. Uh -huh. Not by much, mind you, only okay. about yeah. five microseconds every year. <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> it, it is, um, it's a very observable phenomenon. Mm. I'll give you a good example. A lot of uh, our folks would be familiar with these satellite navigation system in cars. I guess you've probably got one. Yes. Um, we have, and it, it often tells me that it's recalculating and I should turn <laughs> around and go back. But they work on the basis of a constellation of satellites called the Global Positioning Satellites, the GPS satellites. Now, these particular spacecraft are at an altitude of about 20,000 um, kilometres above the surface of the Earth. Now, at that altitude, the atomic clocks on the GPS satellites run quite a deal faster than identical atomic clocks on the surface of the Earth. Why is that? Because of a phenomenon called gravitational time dilation, just like I was mentioning before with what the does high that mean? mountain. Okay. Okay, it's the, uh -huh. same, the same thing. So when you're at a, a lower gravitational field, then time actually runs quicker. Okay. See, one of the, the things, we don't experience this in our own physical world, but time and space and matter are all interconnected. You can't have any one of those three things without the other two. Mm. And we, we don't observe that in our ordinary daily lives. We just accept it. Yeah, well, yeah. they look completely independent. Uh -huh. you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be any connection. Okay. But when you look at things on a cosmological scale, you discover that indeed they are interconnected. Mm. Now, those GPS satellite clocks, because they run a bit faster, they have to be corrected for when your little sat-nav thing determines your position. Okay. Now, you, you should treat your little sat-nav unit with a lot more respect <laughs> in future because if it did not correct for that time dilation uh, effect that I've mentioned, then your position would be in error Okay. at a rate increasing by 400 metres every hour. Wow. So I'd probably be on another country or something like well, that. It wouldn't work, would it? <laughs> it wouldn't work, no. no it would be completely useless. Yeah. So this is a, an experimentally determined effect, this fact that, that uh, time varies throughout the universe. Now, it turns out there are a number of ways in which time can be dilated, not just through gravity, but also through movement, relativistic time dilation, or through the expansion of the the fabric of space itself, if you like. Now, you might recall in our last session we talked about how God stretched out the heavens you know, on that fourth day of creation. Yes. And the picture we have is that as he stretches out the heavens, then space is being massively distorted. Mm. And as it's getting distorted, so too is time. And incidentally, matter will be created as well. Mm -hmm. But remember, we're talking about the fourth day of creation, which was a day of creative activity. Mm -hmm. Now, as God stretches out the heavens, if you had a, a clock at the edge of the cosmos, that clock would be running billions of times faster than an earthbound clock. Mm. Now, it's important to remember that the Bible is written from the point of view of an observer on the earth. So it's talking about an ordinary Earth day. Mm. So it would make no sense if it was written 
you know, um, from uh, someone else's perspective because exactly. it would make no sense to us. It'd be That's irrelevant, right. yeah. That's right. So uh -huh. it's not written from the perspective of someone on another planet yeah. or something. <laughs> it's all about God's dealings with man on planet Earth. Uh -huh. So in that one Earth day, then, we can have massive elapsed time at the outer edges of the universe. Mm. Let me show you a, a short animated clip which will give you I hope, some sort of graphical understanding of, of what I mean by this. Mm, please do. In this clip, we can see here the galaxies being stretched out. There at the centre is the Milky Way galaxy with the Earth in it. And you can see the clocks on the right-hand side, the clock at the outer edge of the cosmos going much, much faster than an Earth-bound clock. And now here we are at the present day, some 6,000 years later. The expansion is completed, presumably, and the clocks are running at approximately the same rate. But the point is that right at the very beginning of that of day four as god stretches out the heavens then clocks at the outer edge of the cosmos would be running very very fast billions of times faster that means that in fact there has been sufficient time for the light at the outer edges of the cosmos to reach planet earth mm -hmm. in fact i believe on uh, that the evening of that sixth day when adam opened his eyes and looked up at the stars what he saw would have been pretty much what we see today when wow. we look at the heavens. Mm. I mean, that really sort of, um, I suppose in my mind at least, it, it answers the puzzle uh, of the question of uh, light, you know, starlight. Now, what does that lead us to conclude? Well, can, can I just, just point out there, you see, you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head precisely because there is an explanation now which relies on um, observable, experimentally verified physics, that's Einstein's equations, and the experiments that we have done that determine that time is not a constant in the universe, and an explanation which is entirely consistent with what the, the Bible. Bible says, mm. then that should be a very, very good, solid explanation. Now, it may not be entirely correct. There might be a, an improvement or some refinement to that from the scientific side. But there is absolutely no reason for people to abandon their faith in what the Bible plainly says simply on the basis of the mystery of distant starlight mm. because today there are very good explanations for it. I mean, some of these things that you've mentioned, I'm sure that you've just summarised these things, but if someone wanted to go into these things and look at them at a little bit more depth, is there a website? Can I get yes, some of this indeed. information elsewhere? Indeed. Well, I'd strongly recommend that uh, people visit our website at creation.com. And if you go into the search window, type in um, distant starlight or something like that, and you will get access to a wide variety of articles. Some of them are at lay level. Some of them actually take you right into the detailed mathematics um, of all the relativistic equations and so on. So if people have an interest at that level, then they can find the information and the material. Is there anything else you would like to share with us, especially about design and creation in terms of evidences in the stars themselves? Well, you know, there's one aspect to this whole issue about scientific theories that we often hear, and people say, a good scientific theory should be able to predict or explain the observable universe around us. And that's very true, it should. Now, there's been some interesting things that have come up in recent times where the conventional Big Bang model, the standard model, really has no adequate explanation. Mm. And uh, I mentioned in a, in a previous session uh, some of the, uh, the observations and the fudge factors that people use, but a little closer to home, there were two spacecraft that were launched back in the 1970s, the Pioneer satellites. And they flew past some of our outer planets and were able to do, take some of the, the early photographs of the surfaces of these planets. Now these two spacecraft are now outside of our solar system, but curiously they have not travelled as far as they should have travelled. It seems as though there's some kind of net acceleration, very, very small, which is pointing back in towards the sun. It's as, as though they're kind of going uphill, as it were. <laughs> they haven't gone far enough. And Big Bang cosmologists have no explanation for the pioneer anomaly. Now, interestingly, when we use a Bible-based cosmology, a spherically 
um, concentric shells of, of galaxies and an expanding universe and looking at, uh, at the sorts of pictures that the, the Bible gives us, then a creationist model actually explains precisely the if, pioneer anomaly. Okay, so it fits in. It does, it does indeed. Uh -huh. Mm. And not only that, um, the particular scientist concerned, Dr. Russell Humphreys, has made some predictions about the nature of planetary magnetic fields. Mm. And uh, one that was interesting is back in uh, the early 70s, I think it was in 1975, uh, the Mariner 10 satellite passed by Mercury, very close to Mercury, and measured its magnetic field. Now, just recently, there was another spacecraft launched to examine Mercury. It's called Messenger. Mm. And the Messenger spacecraft flew past Mercury in January of 2008, and it did some preliminary measurements on the strength of the magnetic field. Now, way back before then, back in the 1980s, Dr Humphreys had forecast that the magnetic field of Mercury would be decreasing. Now, he's a Bible-believing Christian and believes that the solar system was created about 6,000 years ago and on the fourth day of creation, just as, what, uh, as Genesis says. And based on that, he predicted the approximate decrease um, in the magnetic field of Mercury, based also on his uh, understanding of how that magnetic field is produced in Mercury. And you know the measurements that came from Messenger as it went past in 2008 uh, fitted into the range, the band that Dr Humphreys had predicted. Wow. But there is no explanation for it from mm. a big bang sense because mm. it's dropped about 4% in its field intensity over some 33 years, mm. which is far too much if the solar system has been around for four and a half thousand million years, exactly. which is what the Big Bang tells us. I mean, I'm really interested in this stuff, but how does it also relate back to the Bible? How does it relate to, back to God's message for us? I think the fundamental point to make out of all of this is that here in God's Word, the Bible, we have an historical record of what God actually did right back at the creation. Mm -hmm. So we can have confidence that this really is God's Word. And that's important because that same history of creation tells us that God created a perfect world in which he placed Adam and Eve made in his likeness. Perfect people, there was no death, there was no suffering. But it was a result of Adam's rebellion against our creator God mm. that the consequences were that suffering and death would come into the world. So God essentially isn't against science. Absolutely. You're not, not against science, are you? Of course not. <laughs> In fact, some of the greatest scientists like Sir Isaac Newton who have ever lived were passionately committed Bible-believing Christians who believed the opening chapters of Genesis were actually true. Do you find that personally, that that helps the cause and the advance of science? I mean, we don't know everything, right? No, we don't know everything, but we have a framework with which we can investigate the world, and that framework is the Bible's history. Mm. See, the Bible's not a scientific textbook, but it's an historical record that is perfectly trustworthy and reliable. Thank you once again for sharing some of your knowledge with us. It's always a pleasure to have you come on this show and talk You're to welcome. us. If I could just say to our viewers, I really pray and hope that you've found this episode to be